So let's talk about how to put together a reagent table for a laboratory notebook in the organic chemistry lab. Um, we have here an example reaction, and so I've started making a reagent table for that. What we want to do is list all of the ingredients, if you will, of your reaction, so solvents you're using, the reagents you're using. We usually call the organic component starting material, uh, reagent our starting material. So you want to list everything that's going into uh, the reaction that converts your starting material into the product. Okay, and we also want to list here um, on, a, on the last line, let's list our product because this will make our reagent table kind of a place for a one-stop shop and we can go back and see all of the relevant physical properties and amounts and moles and that sort of thing all in one place. So uh, we're going to list uh, for each reagent its uh, molecular weight, its formula mass, uh, its density, if it's a liquid, that's going to be that might be relevant to us, so we can measure things out by volume rather than by mass. Uh, and so those those uh, properties are either given to you in your experimental procedure. If not, you can look them up. Uh, if you just Google any one of these chemical names, it will bring you up to the uh, Wikipedia page. And uh, Wikipedia is really a rich source of chemical information, very trustworthy. Um, a lot of great ways to look up your synonyms or physical properties, that sort of thing. So, uh, so you can find that information electronically as well, in addition to using the CRC handbook or Aldrich catalog or something like that. So uh, the amount column, the amounts are going to be based on your uh, experimental procedure. It's going to tell you how much of each reagent. So the procedure is going to say something like, you know, to 2 milliliters of 2-bromoanilin, dissolved in 10 milliliters of water, we're adding 1.9 grams of sodium nitrite with stirring or some such thing. So we're going to read through that so we can list out the amounts of each. Uh, and then we're going to be calculating the number of moles of each of those, the number of molar equivalents that each represents, and then finally in this last remarks column I have a place where we can put uh, relevant physical properties, the additional physical properties like boiling points for liquids, or melting points for solids, uh, any hazardous uh, uh, properties we can list there. Just a, a nice place to put all that information. So um, now if we're going to calculate the um, moles of 2-bromoanilin, it's given to us in volume and we need to uh, figure out how to convert volume into moles. Well, we can't do that directly, but we can use the density to convert mole, uh, the volume into mass and it says here that it has a density of 1.56 and we need to think about the units of density and remember that water has a density of 1 and so that means uh, just one milliliter of water if you think of a cubic centimeter just a milliliter of water is what weighs one gram so the, de the units for density are grams per milliliter so we have to know those units also, we're going to be using the molecular weight or the formula mass. The units for that is grams per mole. So that tells you how many grams there are given one mole of a substance. So for the 2-bromoanilin, we're going to show our calculations. We're going to start, we have 2.0 milliliters of the 2-bromoanilin. Make sure you're including units in your calculation and also the chemical names so that we're... Um, making sure that we know which which compound we're talking about. Let's convert that to grams. We know that every one milliliter, uh, every one milliliter of the 2-bromoanilin weighs 1.56 grams. So we'll put, make sure to put the milliliters in the denominator so it cancels with the milliliters in the numerator. If we make sure our units cancel, we know we're doing the proper calculation. And now we're in grams, so this might be useful if you want to, instead of measure out the 2-bromoanilin by volume, if you want to weigh it out on a balance, you could do this calculation to find out how many grams that is. But we're interested in the moles, so we can keep going. We'll just keep that number in our calculator, and let's convert now and, and continue. We know that for every one mole of 2-bromoanilin, uh, we have 172 grams. So now again, my grams cancel, and I could do this calculation, and you can try that. Now let's think about significant figures. How many significant figures should we have in our answer? It looks like all of our amounts are kind of given in two significant figures. So let's keep that and we get 0.018 moles of the 2-bromoanilin. So that's the number we're going to put in our table, 0.018.
Now, a lot of times these molar amounts are very small numbers, uh, so if you want to call this column millimoles, then you can multiply these by a thousand, so we could just say there's 18 millimoles of 2-bromoanilin. That might be a convenient uh, title you can have. Okay, so we do the same for the NaNO2. We're starting with 1.9 grams of NaNO2, and we know that for every one mole, there are 69 grams. So we're dividing by the molecular weight, and we come up with 0 0.028 moles of NaNO2. So we can put that up on our table, 0 0.028, and so on. We're going to calculate for each species how much we have. Uh, we have 3.6 grams of Ki, potassium iodide, and for every one mole of that, we have 166 grams, so that comes to 0 0.022 moles of Ki. So we're going to calculate the amount of each reagent that we have. Now what we need to calculate is how much product we can expect to make. We call that the theoretical yield, the maximum amount of product that can be formed. And in order to figure that out, we need to look at our uh, reagents that are going in to decide which of these reagents is going to be the limiting reagent, which is the one that we have the smallest amount of that's going to run out of, uh, we're going to run out of that first. <clears throat> the other reagents are uh, available in excess. So, uh, well, we need to have some understanding of the reaction in order to make this decision, and so I'll tell you that now, that the reaction that we're studying here um, is uh, kind of typical of most reactions in that all of the ingredients that are needed to convert um, this to this, uh, the ones that we've calculated at least, are needed stoichiometrically, meaning uh, we need a full equivalent of each of those in order to create the product. So when we consider that, that all, each of these would be reacting in a one-to-one -one ratio, we see that the number here with the lowest number, 0.018, that's going to be the one that we run out of first, and that's the one that we describe as our limiting reactant. Limiting reactant. So for this determination, we would, we would exclude anything that we are using catalytically, a catalyst, or sometimes acids are added catalytically, or something like that. We wouldn't worry about, uh, we can calculate the number of moles, but we wouldn't ever use that to uh, decide our limiting reactant, because it's not something that's consumed in the reaction. So we're going to take the number of moles of that limiting reactant, and we're going to transfer it down here, because that's how many moles of product I can make. The most I can make is 18 millimoles of product. And so now I'm going to use that to calculate in grams how much product I can possibly make. So let's do that calculation. We have 0 0.018 moles. And we're multiplying. We know we have uh, 283 grams for every one mole. And I do that so that my moles cancel. And now I do that math, and I come up with 5.1 grams of the product. I'll just label it product rather than the 2-iodobromobenzene. So I'll put that up here. I'm going to be sure to include my units because the this column can be any number of units. So it's 5.1 grams sticking to my two significant figures. Um, and so that's how we could calculate our theoretical yield. What goes in this box is the theoretical yield. Now the other column that I have here uh, is called equivalence, and this is a very handy column to have because the mole numbers that we're looking at are kind of random, they're all kind of uh, uh, difficult to compare these numbers, and so what we use for the equivalence is we, we write uh, the ratio here of how much we have of one uh, compound compared to another. So what we do is we take whoever is the limiting reagent and we set that to be one equivalent. So let's say we have 1.0 equivalence of our 2-bromoanilin. And so that means we can form exactly 1.0 equivalent of our product as our theoretical yield. And then how much do we have of these others? We have an excess, but how much of an excess? So what we do is we simply divide all of these numbers by, by 0.018 is what we've done. So we divide 0 0.028 divided by 0 0.018, and we come up to 1.6. So make sure you're always going to the tenths place here so that we could get a fairly precise number. So we get 1.6 equivalents of NaNO2. So that means we're using a 60% equivalent. So we're not using twice as much of this reagent. We're not using 10 times as much. We're using 60% more. And uh, our last one, 0 0.022. 
divided by 0 0.018 and what we get is 1.2 equivalents so again I'm, I'm using just a very slight excess of this reagent of the, of the potassium iodide just 20 percent excess uh, the last calculation that that I just want to go over quickly is when we run the reaction and we get our yield uh, we, we isolate our product and we get our yield uh, the final calculation we're going to be asked for is called a percent yield and this is a very straightforward calculation what we're simply doing is we're going to be taking the actual yield let's say the actual number of grams and we're going to divide that by the theoretical yield in grams and multiply by a hundred percent so it's a very simple calculation we're just saying okay the maximum we could get is 5.1 grams if we got uh, if we got two grams when we isolated our product and purified our product and we got we ended up with two grams that would be about a 40 percent yield so it's just a way to a reflection of how much was obtained versus how much was expected so I hope this helps in getting you ready for uh, doing some some good organic chemistry reactions and getting your lab notebook well prepared before the beginning of your next lab. Thanks.